ladies and gentlemen. My name is Adrian Monk. I'm Managing Director for Public Engagement at the World Economic Forum. That's great. I hope you can hear me now. Uh, and I'm delighted to welcome and introduce the co-chairs for this 33rd World Economic Forum Summit in Delhi. It's taking place under the theme of Innovating India, Strengthening South Asia, Impacting the World. We'll have a chance to hear from each of our co-chairs on their hopes and expectations for the coming two days uh, of the summit. And uh, I'm going to uh, start by uh, introducing the Deputy Prime Minister and Finance Minister of Singapore, Mr. Heng Sui Kiet. So. Can you share with us your hopes and expectations for this meeting? Well, first, I'm very uh, you know, happy to be here for, for this uh, economic summit. Uh, we are going through a period of very major changes in the global economy uh, in terms of the support for globalization in different parts of the world. In some parts of the world, there is a retreat from globalization. In other parts of the world, there is uh, growing interest in globalization, in economic integration, in a better global... Yeah, I'm just going to give you my microphone because uh, I think we're not quite picking you up on the microphone. Oh, okay. Okay, let's try that. Is that better? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> okay. Well, uh, let me repeat that. I'm very happy to be back here in, in India for this uh, economic summit. And we are going through a very a period of very major changes in the global economy First, in terms of the support for globalization. In some parts of the world, there is a retreat from globalization. In other parts, there is a great desire to integrate our economy better, to have better specialization and division of labor, and to look at how, uh, through that, we can raise the productive efficiency of the resources that we have. Now, so that's one aspect. Another aspect is that we are seeing also a growing um, inequality, both in terms of wealth and income, both within countries and across countries. And there is a lot of concern about how that itself is supporting globalization. And third, we are also seeing uh, a lot of concern about the e impact of economic growth on sustainable development, on the environment. So we are undergoing a period of very major changes in the global economy with uh, you know, trade friction that, is, that shows no sign of uh, abating. And this is a very important time for us to come together to look at what is it that we can do together uh, given this broader global context of how South Asia and the rest of the world, Southeast Asia, Asia, and those like-minded countries around the world can come together to provide support for global integration, for the multilateral trading system, and for us to tackle many global challenges around the world. And we see very uh, useful topics in this WEF forum. And uh, in particular, this follows on from what the WEF has been doing in uh, raising this issue of the fourth industrial revolution. I think technological changes are also growing at a very rapid pace. And this is going to have significant effects on almost every sector in the economy. What used to be tradable, what used to be non-tradable, are no longer non-tradable. And uh, with e-commerce, for instance, what used to be pub and mum shop uh, could now be part of a global value chain. So we are seeing these massive changes that are happening. It brings a lot of challenges, but also a lot of opportunities. So I'm very happy that this forum discusses a whole range of different topics, and I look forward to learning from everyone in this uh, forum. Thank you. Thank you. Delighted to welcome one of the, the leader of one of India's biggest healthcare brands, Executive Vice Chair of Apollo Hospitals Enterprise, Shabana Kamenani. Shabana, could you share your hopes for the coming two days summit? Well, one is that um, I didn't want to miss an opportunity uh, of, of a global platform in India where there are more women co-chairs, the Prime Minister of Bangladesh is not here, than men. You know, and this, uh, this actual e inequality, they say, will just, you know, is, is going to equal out 
probably in 70 years, and I won't be around. In the US, it'll probably take 120 years. So that, for me, was number one. That, that here, here was a platform of inequality of women. So happy to do that. Uh, this, the second point is that I think that um, the, the topic is, is so perfect, because we're really talking about innovation from India. And, and people would think that here is a country that, that has so many other challenges, and why are you thinking of innovation when you know you should be thinking of other real level problems for uh, to address the inequality of uh, in, among 1.3 billion? But I think that's where the crux is. That's where the crux is that India will innovate great frugal models that are relevant to the world. And I see nothing as you know rele uh, more relevant than healthcare. That's where it's happening, that here in India, we're able to give health care at a fraction of the cost of the rest of the world. Uh, the Aishman Bharat of the Prime Minister is actually innovating a model where he's, you know, 500 million people will get access to health care. This would have to bring up so much innovation to make it a reality. And from that, India's always been engaged with our region. We've been there in terms of, you know, you say, I think health care is the most uh, uh, in, in terms of diplomacy, a soft diplomacy comes from healthcare, that we treat people from around the region, and I think more of that can happen, that not only can we take our models to the rest of the world, but India will also, you know, through its medical expertise and through some of the technology, what we're working with, the partnerships, international partnerships with global companies, and uh, in this region, so, so I think that when we really talk about innovation, India has excellent models to be able to take, take that around the world, and first regionally, and then through the world, while we face challenges. I think many of them will get uh, at least spoken about here. The, the prime, you, you spoke about some great uh, you know, uh, challenges that are going to take place, so we need to voice that. Thank you so much. Someone who needs no introduction to tennis fans, sports person, and UN Goodwill Ambassador. Sonia Mirza joins us. Sonia, can you share your hopes for this, uh, this summit in the next couple of days? Well, first of all, uh, good morning, everyone. It's an absolute honor to be here, and I think it goes without saying why I'm here looking at the panelists. Um, I feel extremely privileged to be in this company. Um, I think that um, I, as a sports person, can bring, um, I feel sport has brought so much equality in my life, and I feel that that can be in the next two days spoken about and addressed in many ways where we can actually talk about how sport can bring countries together and improve economy in a, in a certain way. And it's happened in amazing countries. You know, it's happened in China and it's happened in, in, in a lot of other countries. So I really hope that one day we get there and hopefully we can address those issues. And the second thing that is very, very close to my heart, which, uh, you know, I, I hope to address in the next couple of days is uh, the equal opportunity for women. Um, you know, it's as simple as that. It's not about the physical strength of being equal to a man. It's about having equal opportunity. Like uh, Shobna auntie, I call her, but Shobna ma'am said she's my she's my best friend's mom. Yeah. So. <laughs> Please so, call me Shobna. <laughs> 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 and, um, you know, like she said, I, I, it's a privilege. I think equality starts right here. We've got more women panelists than men panelists. <laughs> and, uh, so, yeah, I, I really do hope that, um, you know, we, we can address those issues and actually find uh, solutions because there's so much said and done about equality and equal opportunity. It's just about trying to, you know, bring it together and make it happen. Thank you so much. We're talking about innovation. One of the biggest investors uh, in innovation here in India is Sequoia Capital, joined by Shalendra Singh, who's the managing director. Shalendra, what are you hoping to achieve in the next couple of days? First, it's a real privilege and honor to be here. And it's e even greater privilege to be in the minority on the panel. So, <laughs> um, you know, we are, we, are very, um, um, we are very much in the middle of a, a very significant technology-led transformation. We think it's, it's already happened in, in the developed world. It's already played out in the US and China. We think it's happening at a very rapid pace uh, in India and Southeast Asia. Uh, and it's happening across sectors, as Minister Heng mentioned. And um, we think you know, the rise of technology over the next 10 years will be pretty transformational. The largest market cap companies will be technology companies. Many of them are still quite young. And it's already 
playing out that in a various different sectors, the young upstarts are the, are the most important and the largest companies uh, you know, in India and in Southeast Asia already. And in this type of an environment, we feel like you know, successful tech companies are going mainstream, and mainstream, tech com tech, mainstream companies have to become technology companies. Every company has to become a technology company. And from our vantage point, you know, we think the World Economic Forum is a great platform for old, uh, traditional, established, incumbent, profitable businesses to actually meet and engage and, and, uh, and learn about innovation from, from the, the new upstarts. Um, and, and we try to invite, uh, um, along with the forum, you know, several dozen of the new and emerging technology leaders uh, to, to, to this venue to essentially engage in dialogue so there's better understanding um, of how to build um, you know, a, a, a healthier ecosystem together. Thank you. And lastly, um, delighted to be joined by uh, some uh, a company that came out of the first uh, dot-com uh, revolution, uh, Booking.com, and their chair, Gillian Tans. Gillian, can you share some of your hopes for this, uh, this meeting? Yeah. Well, first of all, it's, it's great to be here on, on this platform today. Also, if you think about uh, the progress that has been made in India, in, uh, in the sector where we operate, India was ranked by the and Tourism Council in the top three, looking at the past seven years from 185 countries, the progress that has been made. So we can say that has been uh, enormous improvements uh, that we see in this market. Then, uh, if you look at overall economic growth and the ambition of the Prime Minister to go in five years to a five trillion dollar company, and to do this through pillars like inclusiveness, innovation, infrastructure, but also interna international connections. I think it's great that we are all here together, also international businesses, to see how we can contribute uh, to, this, to this mission. And um, Booking is a company that really wants to, wants to empower people to experience the world, and we really do that to, to boost local entrepreneurs, and therefore we, we, thrive, we, we bring economic uh, growth. Um, if you think about it, we connect uh, all of our partners to the digital age. Even in, in India, we have 55,000 partners where we operate with uh, not only big hotels, but most of them are, are small, uh, small properties, local entrepreneurs. And we really try to create advantages. So we create advantages for these businesses. We create uh, advantages uh, for our platform, for our customers but also for the society as a whole. And um, my personal passion is around women and technology and really to help entrepreneurs all around the world uh, uh, to realize their dreams. And um, with Booking, we are very proud of what we have accomplished so far. And there's lots of examples we still see today, even here in India, people that are becoming a local guy to show their destinations. We see people opening up their homes uh, to bring local dining experiences, open and up to stay at their houses. Uh, and even a company like Punjab, which is a company called Women on Wheels, who uh, provides taxi services by women to make it more safe for women to take taxis. That's a company that we also support within our booking booster. Gillian, thank you very much. Uh, we have time for some questions. If I can get a sense in the room of uh, who has a question, if you could just raise your hand. Uh, and if we can uh, ensure that we're on uh, questions for all of our panelists and uh, that take in the theme of the meeting, that would be a fantastic uh, way to run this press conference. If you can just tell us your name and uh, your organization, uh, before you ask, that'll be fantastic. And can we get a microphone to the mm -hmm. uh, folks with their hands up, please? Thank you. M my name is Philippe Monnier, representing La Gefie from Switzerland. I have a question to Mr. Hanswick Kitt. I have a privilege to live in your country for two years, and I was impressed. I think it's a model country not only in terms of economic development, but also in terms of social, religious, and many other things, development. So my question is, to which extent do you feel that the success of Singapore can be replicated to other countries? That's a great question. Um, and can we also 
so offer the microphone to the gentleman there, and then if I can grab it back, I'll have. Hi, uh, I'm Sajid here from Bloomberg Quint. Uh, my question is for Mr. Singh. Uh, especially uh, for the private equity space and startups in India, uh, what is the kind of lessons uh, that you learn from the WeWork debacle? Uh? <laughs> Great. Can I steal it back? We're rationing microphones here. We're being very sustainable. Um, <laughs> Great couple of questions. Uh, one on Singapore's model and how applicable it is across South Asia. And secondly, I think looking at the future of, um, of the dot-com second round with the, the, uh, the IPO of, of WeWork that's uh, taken so much media attention. Um, if I can start by turning to Deputy Prime Minister and just uh, ask you, sir, uh, are there uh, lessons from Singapore that are applicable across the region that you feel? Um, or do you feel that uh, there's uh, things for both, uh, both sides to learn across, uh, across this region? Well, first, uh, let me, can you all hear me? Yeah. Oh, that's good, yeah. <laughs> well, first, let me say that uh, thank you for your compliments on our success. But I have to add that you know, one must never take success for granted. We just have to keep running because the changes are happening even faster. Now, uh, if I would say that, and I wouldn't say that there's a particular model that is applicable across the world, but I would say that there are uh, useful lessons that we ourselves have learned uh, that we can share and that others, and we can also learn from others. Now, one important lesson really is that the economy is a very, uh, it's very dynamic. There will be constant changes. And over the last 50 odd years of our independence, we have gone through waves and waves of uh, changes. The, it, the key is to stay useful and relevant to the world all the time. And at the time when you have many rapid changes that are happening, whether it's in the support for globalization, whether it is in technology and the fourth industrial revolution, or whether it is in educating our people, reskilling our workers, all these are uh, major issues which every country will have to respond to. But how we respond to will very much depend on the path that we've taken so far. Economic development is somewhat path dependent. You can't just switch into a completely different path. You just can't switch to a completely different path uh, tomorrow. And that we'll have to you know, tag and try to get to the right path at the right time. So on that, I would say that uh, what we have found to be extremely useful is first, uh, being part of a global economy, and that's why we are strong supporters of globalization of, uh, of the multilateral framework and multilateral institutions. Uh, but when I was in Doha, when the Doha round was launched, but unfortunately, we have not made much progress in the Doha round. So what we have done instead is that we want to create opportunities to collaborate with uh, many different countries around the world, so we started the free trade negotiations first with New Zealand and then from there uh, and of course within ASEAN. So the ASEAN Economic Community uh, has been a real work in progress. It has grown significantly. And beyond that, uh, we have also negotiated many free trade agreements from all parts of the world, including US, China and of course India. Now, the next phase that we hope that we can work together is to continue to build on this RCEP, the Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership. And I hope that uh, India will be a very major uh, player in this. Now, this is not to advocate that we should become Fortress Asia, but rather we should use this to catalyze support for further liberalization at the WTO, but at a pace which allows our people to uh, respond, to uh, benefit from, and this is, uh, will be one major issue that we can work together. And the other is, of course, dealing with this, the fourth industrial revolution. Uh, the uh, Shalendra's point about the importance of innovation is going to be very important. And how do we uh, all work together to support the science, technology, and innovation? You see research bodies all over the world doing work. You see corporates doing work on this area. But I think if we can, again, work together, we'll all be stronger. And the last point I made is that since, like Shalendra, I'm the, the one that is, we, we, we too are outnumbered by all the ladies, <laughs> and I'm very happy to see that. And uh, I think in many parts of the world, we, um, we can unleash 
far uh, better uh, economic opportunities if we empower our women. And in that regard, I would say it's not just about economic growth. More importantly, is that I think we want to create a system where every person, whether a man or woman, have the opportunity to realize their full potential and to fulfill their aspirations. And here we have three great role models of you know, what they can do to show that women can lead companies, can lead startups, and can be great in sports. So thank you. <laughs> Shandra, you are also uh, Indian based in Singapore. Are there things uh, that you think uh, Singapore has to offer in terms of models for India and perhaps things that India has, uh, has to offer in, in terms of Singapore? And also, just uh, to the point made by the other gentleman, uh, we've seen with, uh, with some of the oxygen being sucked out of the startup sector by the WeWork experience, We've also had Thomas Cook, 150 years old, collapsing. What are the implications for the sector you're in? I think I'll answer the first question um, first, which is, uh, you know, I, uh, to us, um, technology is transforming all regions, India, South Asia, Southeast Asia, and there's lots of potential for collaboration, lots of potential for learning. You know, uh, I, I've been, um, just like uh, somebody mentioned, you know, really amazed by the system of governance in Singapore, and it makes for a very uh, an efficient environment. And I think the Indian government also has sort of, um, you know, made a pretty tremendous progress in the last several years with the ease of doing business rankings, with uh, with some very transformational things like uh, UPI Aadhaar in financial services and financial inclusion in payments. And I think, you know, definitely learnings apply on both sides, and, and there are plenty of examples uh, where, where there's lots to uh, sort of you know, learn from each other. Um, I think coming back to the question on tech uh, and, and uh, the VWORK issue, I'm not qualified to specifically comment on VWORK, but I think it's a reminder uh, from afar, and so I'm an observer just like everybody else. I think it's a reminder that, you know, uh, companies of scale should be built with an enduring company mindset and that, you know, businesses should have a, uh, uh, inherently should be built with, uh, with the view to be sustainable. Uh, and. Um, uh, and, and, and such, and, and have great governance around them. So I think uh, it's, it's an important reminder. I think uh, lots of very high quality companies are being built in this region. And I think some will go through their cycle of you know, ups and downs as they go through it. You know, this process of tech transformation is never a straight line. And it goes through some, um, you know, some ups and downs because you know, uh, as somebody who's you know, been investing in tech for, for a dozen plus years, you know, these companies are immensely fast growing and immensely fast changing, and there's no, often no playbook to follow. But I think the, the principles of enduring companies and the principles of good governance still apply. And I think it's a reminder that, you know, you, you have to sort of uh, really, um, you know, embrace innovation by keeping those two principles at the, at the core of how you innovate. Gillian, booking.com came out of the first dot-com boom, and yes. you know, not every company out of that boom survived. Um, I mean, are there lessons from what your company went through that apply in this round of, uh, of unicorns and perhaps overexcitement? Yeah, so what I've seen at booking, with what is extremely important is to keep focusing on customers because customers change. And especially if you think about technology, customers also get much more advanced in technology. And you need to make sure you keep adapting to the needs of these customers. You need to make sure you keep innovating. And we've seen it as well when we are now 20 years old, but when mobile started to arise, that was an interesting moment for a company like Booking that basically was founded on, on only desktop. And then to see, okay, can we also be successful with customers that are booking through mobile devices and are, that are actually traveling with their mobile device and we can have much more of an influence on customers even throughout their journey and be much more of a help. And I think that's the journey that Booking has gone through. And for me, that has been critical to the success to, that Booking is still accomplishing today. Can I just get a sense in the room if we have more questions for our co-chairs? Uh, ladies, there and there, please. And uh, I think, am I going to have to give up my microphone? I think I am. Let me pass it down to you. Um, 
I have a question for Minister Heng, please. Rebecca Bundin from CNA. Um, I'd like to ask you about the status um, and developments of the third uh, comprehensive economic cooperation agreement. You spoke quite a bit about uh, trade relations there, so I'm wondering if there are any developments that you can share with us, uh, any kind of progress, any sticking points. Um, also, um, with regard, with regard to, to these kind of relations between countries in the region, could you talk about your views on current ties with uh, ASEAN and South Asia at the moment? What are the challenges there, please? That is a great question. Um, I'd like to bring in some of our other co-chairs as well. So if you have a question which can engage our panel, that would be fantastic. OK. Um, well, my question is mostly for, uh, my name is Saheli, I'm from CNBC, based in Singapore. Uh, my question is mostly for Minister Hing, but uh, I mean, love to hear all of your views too. Uh, so Singapore and India has increased its collaboration over the years, so much so that Prime Minister Modi has recently said that you know, the relation has gone from one of competition to collaboration. And Mr. Heng, you spoke about how you know, there is growing inequality in terms of wealth and income and how economic growth uh, is having an impact on sustainable development. So can you share your thoughts on what you feel is the future of this India-Singapore relationship and how it can address some of the topics that are of importance to this forum today. Thank you very much. And before I bring the Deputy Prime Minister in, um, the points you raised about inequality are fundamental to, I think, a lot of the conversations that are going to take place in the next couple of days. And I just wanted to bring in uh, Shabana and... Uh, Sonia, on that, um, Shimano, if I can just ask you, um, you know, inequality underpins a lot of the conversations around healthcare, and you know, you uh, as as a leader in one of the principal healthcare brands uh, in India have uh, a role to play in kind of addressing that. Uh, how do you see that coming up in the next couple of days? Thanks, Adrian. Um, I'm I'm going to actually anchor your question into something that you want, that you spoke about India and Singapore. And one of the exciting things is while Singapore is looked at as the innovation hub, a lot of Singapore companies look to India and its population to see how they can commercialize it first. So while, and, and some of us house our, com our, our companies outside and, and Singapore being the first destination. So I think there's a lot of collaborative in terms of the innovation and the models coming up. And I can tell you in healthcare, uh, we've had many companies from Singapore that, that you know, innovated in Singapore but said, look, we can't commercialize, we can't take it to scale. Could you please incubate it within the Apollo Hospital system? And I think that's a model that will, that will increasingly start in many areas. And one I'd like to particularly point out is that when Singapore came to us, you know, IA of Singapore came to us and said, we have a lot of small companies that are interested in this, in, in, in this uh, uh, smart cities, but we've really missed the bus in, to some extent with all the big consortiums. But we have people who can think about doing smart villages and smart rural hubs. So you're looking at Singapore, which is probably uh, an island city nation, you know, all about a city, and you're trying to take this out into the rural areas. And I think these are very exciting, the thought process that, that we can actually think these things through across the sea, across a country. So innovation would come from many of these ideas and partnerships. And Sonia, you travel across the region, you're a, as a goodwill ambassador. Uh, what is your experience in looking at lessons that the region can kind of draw on uh, across the different examples in terms of tackling inequality? Well, I mean, I think that um, if it comes actually to Singapore, funnily enough, it, it, it used to hold the biggest tournament that the WTA ever had which I happen to win twice, actually, so which is why I personally <laughs> love Singapore. But <laughs> I think, you know, I think that uh, said a lot in terms of uh, innovation that we were talking about to bring tennis to a region in Asia, which um, is not necessarily known for tennis. We're more known uh, in Asia for other sports. Um, and I think that these are uh, the steps that are taken. And, you know, now, obviously, that tournament, I think, has been moved to China. So that just 
has opened up gates for other countries as well um, you know to to have the biggest women's tournament as a tennis player i can say that for me it was a privilege but um, having said that though i think that uh, traveling across the world and coming back to inequality i think inequality exists everywhere in in all kinds of things whether it's economic uh, growth whether it's women um, you know and i specifically obviously deal with that uh, on many levels but uh, there's inequality even today in sport where we're still supposed to um, justify why we get equal prize money even though we do so um, you know i i mean obviously i think <laughs> that uh, in this in in this time and age when we still need to justify that and we still need to explain why it happens i think that is an opportunity for us to over here uh, try to address that issue and try to actually do something about it where uh, you know as as women we don't need to be um, always questioned or answered about uh, why you know equal Equality, equality uh, needs to exist. Deputy Prime Minister, can I turn to you now? Well, first of all, let me uh, add to the comments of uh, Shobana and uh, Sonia on the, this issue of uh, you know how Singapore can be a gateway. Yeah, you mentioned that it's interesting that the companies, the startups in Singapore, find India a great place to scale up, and uh, I think this is the example of collaboration that I have been mentioning which is that Singapore, is, because we are small, we have to uh, play in a very different way. We have to maximize the advantage of being small. The fact that we are one layer of governments, that we have regulatory agencies that work well together with the development agencies, allow us to make changes to rules and regulations much uh, faster. And one good example is in FinTech. The, the Monetary Authority of Singapore, which is our central bank and regulator, is also the agency that is promoting innovations in fintech. But financial services has its own characteristics that if you don't regulate it well, you can end up with a problem, including financial crisis. So what MAS has done is that they have created this idea of a regulatory sandbox. So anything that is done within this box with well-defined parameters uh, are allowed where existing rules don't apply. But if you want to scale up, you can then do some, you have to do something else. So we hope that beyond the sandbox, in many ways, because Singapore is small and we can make rules, changes to rules and regulations much more easily, uh, we hope that that can be a source of uh, uh, innovation too. And in that regard, it allows for different models, whether it's healthcare, whether it's you know, booking of uh, travel, whether it is uh, even in a tennis game, uh, to, for us to uh, do a lot of that. And at the same time, to have very close relationship with our partner economies, and India is certainly one of this, and for us to then uh, take the innovation to scale. Uh, and if it can be done within Asia, it can be done throughout the world. So this is a value. Now, back to the two questions on uh, the seeker. Well, seeker negotiations are uh, ongoing, and you know, the upgrade will be... Um, uh, Minister uh, Chan Chun Singh is dealing with this. And he has told me that you know they are making good progress. And beyond that, uh, we are also uh, in discussions on the RCEP, the Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership Agreement. I very much hope that India will be uh, a, a part of this very important agreement. And uh, again, uh, I, I hope that we can make good progress. The, the progress we are seeing is encouraging, and I hope we build on that. Then on the question on the... Uh, competition and, and collaboration. I, I think across all fields of activities, competition and cooperation will be an important model. The, my favorite example is, I think those of you who have been to Singapore, you know we have plenty of uh, hawker centers. And in a hawker center, they sell a variety of food. Now, if every hawker sells the same identical food, only one or two will survive because the one or two that is the best in, that, in selling the same food will scale and take over the whole hawker center. But that will make the hawker center itself very, uh, you know, very unattractive because nobody is going to eat the same thing in the same place. So in the same way, I think whether it's companies, whether it's countries, all companies in the same industry face the same common challenges, whether it is about the trading rules, whether it's about labor, 
the skills of the labour or whether it is about government regulations. And I do believe that companies ought to come together within the same industry to look at how we can solve these issues together. And in fact, Switzerland is a very good example of this. I visited Switzerland to, start to look at what they were, the companies were doing. But at the same time, each company seeks to differentiate itself. That I'm offering consumers something different, something better than the other one. And, that I'm, and because it is different, you can see how different consumers which, who have different preferences will go to different uh, places. And the same must apply, the same applies for economies. You cannot have two economies operating identically, you know, trying to have the same competitive advantages. Not possible. That. But we should then look at how we can collaborate and uh, leverage off each other's uh, strengths. Thanks. That's a great point, Deputy Prime Minister. And uh, one of my principal missions is to deliver all of our co-chairs to the opening plenary, which starts in seven minutes. <laughs> so uh, if you'll forgive us for uh, departing promptly, I know there'll be a chance during the next couple of days to speak to them individually and follow up on uh, anything that uh, you really would like to pursue further. Thanks to all of them. I uh, wish everyone here a very profitable and enjoyable uh, two days. And uh, see you in the opening plenary. Thank you. Thank you.